G'day guys, welcome to this episode of the Process of Success podcast. I'm here today with England uh, women's sports psychologist, Mike Rotherham. Mike, thanks very much for joining us. No problem. Now, um, first of all, how did you get into sports psychology? Um, so for me, it was more around um, personal experiences, wanted to play professionally, realised I wasn't very good enough, um, and you know, this was an area of the game that really interested me. So it was, um, yeah, it just kind of went hand in hand from my own experience as well. Awesome. And did you study sports psychology at uni? Yeah, so I was, um, I spent basically nine years at university. We're having three years doing at Sheffield Hallam doing a um, sports science degree, followed on by a master's degree, then a PhD in the YIPS. Wow. Um, and then all the while training up on the applied side. PhD in the yips. What did that? What is? What did that involve? Was it just? Just trying to find out what was going. What? Yeah. What? What happens with it? And what? What causes it? How you? How you treat it? And can you remember that? Was that a little while ago? Can you remember? Can you give us a little bit of insight into some of the findings from that? Yeah, I mean, a lot of people think it's um, a brain disorder with the with 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 the yips, but a lot of the stuff we were we were finding is it's 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 more trauma based. Um, um, either like what we call like a small t trauma or big t trauma so typically those who experience the yips have had lots of small what we call a small t is like a, an embarrassing situation or lots of things kind of layered on and then an event might trigger it off in a game and you think where the hell's this come from or it might be like what we call like a big t event which would be you know like a death of someone in the family and then all of a sudden go out a couple of weeks later and then the, the individual might yip up Excellent. Wow, that's very interesting. And and how did you? What were your findings? How how do you then now coach um, athletes not to, to get the yips? I suppose. Um, well, there's a couple couple of things. So generally, there's there's certain personality types being more susceptible to it. Um, so people who are what we call a like high and maladaptive perfectionism. Um, so on the the bad, the like what I call like the dark side of perfectionism. So you have like the bright side, which is you know for someone who's goal orientated, achievement striving. Dark side is someone who beats themselves up, critical of themselves. It's never, it's never good enough. So generally, people who who, who form on on that side of things with um, obsessional thinkers, typically they're obsessional thinkers and quite self conscious about themselves. So a lot of it's around helping them work with their personality characteristics and um, not be as hard on themselves. Um, and then the the other side would then be around in the in the train in the train environment and the competition environment, helping them develop skills that um, yeah that they can manage with the with the pressure scenario mm, awesome awesome now we'll get into perfectionism shortly it's something I'm, I'm really interested in but what just for some of our younger viewers and listeners who might not have had an um, experience with a sports psychologist or sports psychology before what what is it really what what is sports psychology <laughs> just another coach really yeah um, yeah you, you, you're a coach who looks after the, the, the what's going on what's going on up here in, in your nuggins really yeah so it's about the mind and how yeah. the mind works under under stress and under yeah. performance you train your physical skills this is just about training with your mental skills and being able to use your physical skills when you need to use them awesome and now if you were to get into the mind of an elite athlete or a very successful athlete what are some of the traits or what are some of the things that they do Um. I think there's some qualities that you, you, you'll see from like, I think the, 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 they are highly, highly driven, they're excessively driven. Um, they're ruthless um, when, when, they, when they need to be ruthless, very diligent in terms of the, the, the preparation. Um, you know, they, they have a real sound understanding of themselves in terms of what, make, what makes them work, what makes them tick. Is, um, that, is that something that they've learned over time or is that I think something? So. I think so. Um, I think that's going through through reflection through the coaches, the people people around them. Um, you got some who sit on the, the probably the more talented end of the spectrum. I have no idea, and you know, the, the 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 side of that where you're actually trying to help them be aware, but mm. there's is too much awareness actually a bad thing for those kind of players mm. because that just that awareness maybe makes them overthink things. Yeah, yeah, danger. How how do you deal with or coach a player that does overthink things and? And really, probably overanalyzes things, and that holds them back. Yeah, you try, you're trying to get the back to real simple, simple things. Simple, like just watch the ball. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So their the, their automatic their automatic nature can take take over. The, the 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 last thing you want in a in a competitive environment is to be thinking about stuff, thinking about stuff that's 
irrelevant. I mean, the, the game of cricket does require thinking. You have to think about um, you have to think about game scenarios. You have to think about um, you know like your, your, your game plans for different different bowlers about how you're going to go about about things. But the things you don't want to be thinking about are very very internal thoughts. Where like where's my back lift? How's my hands on the bat? Are my feet moving? Um, you're trying to get people. You're trying to get players into a place where they can think in an automatic, automatic fashion, where it's just watch the ball and it's think almost like think it, do it. You you you, you know you the, the, the you, you, your subconscious takes over and the rest of it just happens. And so, do you then teach them or coach them to do that in their practice sessions, and you really get them to narrow their focus, and you work with the athlete and say, all right, next time you go to the nets, I want you to try and just focus on this and this and try and not pay attention to like some of those other thoughts or how do they actually implement it yeah so we, we, we'll kind of break sessions down into um so our training sessions will either be one of um a, a, a sort of a, a mindset session which will be um you're working on perhaps you're working on poking a little bit yeah but like so from the coach's point of view they want to they want to find out a bit more about yeah them. so yeah we want to poke we want to get them into an emotional state we want to see can they can they um, can they regulate themselves to get back into here and now and actually manage manage themselves and this so, is done sort of in a cricket sense or is this done in a classroom in a sense, sense, yeah, like it's yeah. in the nets or something yeah absolutely it's do, it's done live and I think they're they're often the best the best sessions and my role will be supporting the coaches. Um, supporting the players in those, those environments, acting as a bit of a, a facilitator at times to actually create some of the learning, and then you're hoping the player comes away with something to go, ah, right, I recognise that actually that impacted my ability to think in the here and now. What I need to do is. Can you give us an example of how you poke them? How you. Is it sort of just getting to face quite fast, like really fast bowling that evokes uh, fear, or is it trying to put them in a, in a, uh, a situational based training session? or? Yeah, there's 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 generally the people will generally be um, susceptible to one or two things. One is people who are like quite high in what we call like threat sensitivity. So they're they're sensitive to things that could go wrong, the what ifs, um, you know, bad outcomes. Um, so what you're trying to create, you you probably try and create with them is you'll try and bring make the outcomes like really, really live for mm. them and actually talk up the consequences, talk up the things that could go wrong, put consequences in place if they. If they mess up, um, then you've got people who are very reward sensitive, and they're 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 all they're thinking about is, I could win, I could win. Mm. Uh, there's a prize at the end of the, mm. there's a prize at the end of the um, the training session that I could I, or, or or the game. They're the people who want to be there. You know the, they they want the glory. They want the the opportunity. Um, and uh, and for them it's about you know you, you might actually put the prize there in front of them so actually they can. Yeah, it's theirs so, to lose, or uh, yeah, absolutely. And can can they manage that side of things? Can they um, refrain from the impulse the, the, and and keep themselves not getting too excited? Mm. And is that something you do a personality test? Or yeah, yeah, yeah. We use a lot of personality measures to to understand the players, and and again, it, it's not a um, it's not an an answer. It's just a, it gives us a window to say what's going on for this player. Yeah. Now might we work best with them? And what how much of what you do and what you see and the players you work with, how much of it is the personality and how much of it is can be trained and, and improved? Yeah, it, 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 the, the, the nature-nurture debate's been, been around for um, years. I, mean, I think the reality is it's probably 50-50. Mm. Um, 50% you, you're going to inherit your, your genes from your... Um, you know, your, your parents and 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 fifty percent is the environment that you're in. So, the what we do know is the environment you're in will either switch on or switch off certain parts of your your you know, your personality. And you, yeah, absolutely, you can you can train it. Yeah, and so can their physical, their mental skills that can be improved. Yeah, no matter what your personality. Absolutely. Yeah. Um. Now, having worked with some of the world's best players and you're with, with the England women at the moment. What are some sort of mental preparation skills that some of the the ladies use at the moment? Um, I think I think the first thing is having a really um, having a really clear routine about what they're what they're what they're trying trying to do. Um, so that that'll be, you know, in the days leading up to a game, you know, they'll have a very very set correct set plan about what they're what they're trying to do on on certain days. So, um, you know, leading up to the morning of the game, 
their their, prepar their preparation to actually when they walk out to bat and, and face a ball everything's very very you know if you if you're taking a snapshot of one of the players and you you, know, you took the, the fact that they're playing against uh, let's say South Africa today um, and you you kind of just to watch that video you, you you'd see the same routine. Mm. Um, regardless of opposition, I mm. think, and that's the that's the key. And there's always challenges with that, you know. Like so, whether you know, so certain grounds you might go to might not have certain certain facilities that some of them are used to. So again, it's that how do they take aspects of that routine and make make so sure it, it doesn't make or break them yeah, if they yeah, can't do it. Yeah. Absolutely. I think that's a especially at an amateur level that can be a really um, thing that makes or breaks people is. If they rock up and there's no nets and they have yeah. to hit on the outfield, then they throw their toys out of the pram and right. their innings is almost over before they've even started. That's right. And so it's it's a real skill to be able to manage that emotion. Um, now, what are some techniques that you teach your athletes and, and train them in to help their mental and emotional skills? Do you do things like imagery or meditation or? Um, we will, we'll, I wouldn't necessarily say so. There's been like a there's a toolbox of things we'll do it. A lot of it's based on the individual that you're working with. Um, I, mean, I know from, from from my side, I I'll, I'll work from a very very um, strengths orientated strengths orientated approach. So what we're trying to always do with with the players is build on what they're what they're best at, um, build on build on their resources, their strengths, and actually turn them into super strengths. Um, because that's actually a source of confidence, and then what you then try to do is create the environment that they can actually go out and use those strengths in the environment. So again, I think you see a lot of the stuff that um, certainly with the women, they they play a very brave brand of cricket, mm. and I think that's a lot of the lot to do with the the environment our coaches set up that allow them to play that way. Mm. Um, I think we, do, you know, certainly some of some of the players, we, you know, you have to deal with a lot of noise in your in your in your head. Uh, you know the, the the man on the shoulder, so to speak, who go on do it or don't don't do yeah, it. Yeah. You, you know that that's that's the same in every every player. You know we'll work, we'll certainly work with the players around. You know very very much in terms of probably mi mindfulness based techniques to um, help quiet quiet the noise in your quiet the noise in your head. But that's no different to that's something you can find on any any given yeah. app. You yeah, know, yeah, 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 and. Um, how do you then, you've just mentioned the noise in the head, how do you coach or train them to not pay attention to that negative story, story or voice that's there and, and like try and focus on something that's a bit more positive and makes them feel a bit calmer? I wouldn't say it's about ignoring it. I think it's about accepting that it's yeah. there. Um, yeah, so that you can't, you can't turn off the noise in your head. No. You, but what you can do is kind of go, I can hear you, accept you there. But I'm going to tune into watching the ball anyway. Yeah. Um, you know, a lot of people, and the the, dan the danger you, you you can have is you can get into that that story of well, I, why am I thinking these thoughts? I shouldn't be thinking these thoughts, and then that just creates a whole another yeah, yeah, yeah. cycle of uh, emotion that you kind of just go around it. Well, actually, just going, yeah, I, I accept I'm feeling quite negative today, right? But what I need to do is actually tune in to watch the ball. I need to tune in to get my feet going. I need to tune in to being energized at the crease. I need to tune into my intent. Mm. So it's just it's just putting the attention on yeah. the the thoughts that serve the player rather yeah. than fighting that voice and saying don't think that don't do this it's yeah. just a slight change yeah um, now how do you coach your athletes to deal with pressure and expectation that they either put on themselves or they feel from an outside source. Um, uh, well, we can, without, without giving too much away. I mean. I, I, it, all of our players will. All of our players will, will have a. Um, you know, we we will do, almost like a summary page of you know what what goes on for that player. Them at the best, them at the worst, the things that probably act as derailers for them. Um, you know what we what we what we what we try and do is um, under understand those so actually we can help minimise those. Yeah. Um, from a from a an an, an environment point of view. From a training point of view, as I said earlier, you know you're always trying to create um, pressurized environments as much as you can. So there's the bit of can you can you have you got the skill to be able to play reverse sweep, for instance. But then there's the can you use that skill in the right context at the right time in the right conditions under pressure. Mm. That's a very very different. That's a very very different thing. Um, and again, what you what you're trying to do is is uh, manipulate the training environment as much as you can. 
So you do get the heart going. You do mm. get the, the the mind racing a little bit, and then can they? And in a supportive way, you co- you, you 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 use that environment to coach them to help them develop their own skills. Right. So it's then if they've done it enough and they've hopefully succeeded a number of times in that training environment that's under pressure, then they can feel calmer and more able yeah. to deal with it in the moment in the game. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Now. You've just talked about the environment. How do you create an environment like it's a game, like in a training environment? Because obviously you're dealing with um, elite sport. You're dealing yeah. with women's professional cricket. There could be 30,000 people at Lords for a World Cup final like yeah. there was last year. How do you then set that environment up at training? You're never, you're never going to recreate 30,000 people. Um, no, that, that that's on yeah that's not not realistic but there's, there's 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 different things you can do I mean you know so whether it's um whether it's creating you know you're playing on a on a pitch that's um an exaggerated version of what you might play on so it might be you know like a really dusty pitch you know like a, it's going to be like a real spit a spinning top is actually an exce- excessive mm. excessively so it might be um, in terms of creating like competitions you've actually got lead- leaderboards that actually the players are then comparing themselves to each other um, it might be that you're creating a bit of judgment so you've got the, co- the coaches there watching the session but actually you know they're actually mar- marking stuff and again it's just you just you're creating that um, that thing that actually this is this is different the, t- the, 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 the very thing that, the, the, that you're trying to create within um, Within training is the, th- the fact that a it's com- it's competitive, so I, I'm competing against each other, and there's an element of judgment in comparison because yeah. they're the, they're the things that are present when you when you're competing. Yeah, and you you trying to you trying to make that work for the player. Yeah, awesome. Um, now, as a player yourself, how do you implement the mental techniques that you know help elite athletes into your own game? You've obviously played a lot of cricket yourself. How do you, it's being probably, a sports psychologist, it's made me think too much? I was going to say, has it has it made you overthink things? Yeah, prob- probably. Um, yeah, I, 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 I think if anything, it's just the it, it, it's the consistency of your preparation, consistency of your. I mean, I say the, the older you get, the more you know you know your own game. The things you know um, build your confidence, and the bits you know that take away your confidence. So I, I, I you know, from my own side, I, I'd know that doing a weakness based session let's say for instance or like doing like sticking a video on and, and um, analyzing technical stuff two or three days for a game is not going to serve me well mm. it, it's actually probably just doing more feel good based stuff yeah okay um, but I think also as an amateur player for, me, for myself it's acceptance that I can't do all the stuff that the pros would do yeah yeah I can't necessarily work on all the skills that I'm probably going to need on a Saturday afternoon so I have to kind of accept what I've got yeah. and do best with what I've got yeah. which isn't a lot these days <laughs> <laughs> probably being a bit hard on yourself but it's what's come what's become blatantly obvious in all my research and reading over the last few years is is how important self-awareness is and that seems to be the thing that allows athletes to then perform do you sort of work with your athletes quite regularly on reflecting you said you've got the one page summary do you sit down with each individual and say, where are you at? How are you feeling? What are you doing? Or is that something that's sort of left to the, them to do? Yeah, I, th- I think it's, um, you, you're trying to always encourage self-reflection. So after, after a game, after a training session, um, might be a bit of time when, when things have gone really well. Um, t- even just as much when times have gone, has gone poorly, you, you're trying to pick those bits and go, what was it about that time? What yeah. did you do? Yeah. Ah, right. What I did was this, right? Can we use that? Can we build that into, into what you do, your preparation? And what I would say to any any young players, it's never you've never all of a sudden got, you know, you never get to a point you go right, that's it. You're always looking to build and evolve. You've got the the, the stable, what we call like the secure bases of what you, you know, the foundations of your game that are there, but you're always kind of adding adding stuff on. Mm. Mm. Something that ever stops. No, absolutely. I think we've all got to always be students of the game and, and try and evolve. Um, now, as a as a batting coach, I talk a lot to my athletes about a pre-ball routine, both physically and mentally. Is that something you speak to your athletes or work with them about? Yeah, I mean, it, that's more. That'd be more from um, our coaches would probably take more more handle on that on the on the ground. And again, we, you know, my role would be to help facilitate the coaches in in, in that but then that's more of a um, 
the practical hands on the coaches side of things and ultimately what you're trying to do with with, with the routine I, I think I think your routine serves two things it's one is my am I is my focus in the here and now and two am I in the right emotional state to face this ball it's generally what you're trying to do and yeah I see a lot of players will go through the routine they'll fiddle with the pads they'll twi- flip, flip their uh, bat round but Again, it's what what purpose is your routine serving? Your routine has to serve the purpose of am I watching this ball and it, am I am I actually in the here and now and have I got myself either into like a really activated state, like quite pumped up or actually probably more relaxed. And um, it'd be different for each person. It'd be different for each person. Yeah, some players need to be more more activated. Other players need to be more quite cool, quite chilled, quite calm, and relaxed. Yeah, and I think. The key to being successful um, long term is to try and figure that out about yourself it as is, quickly as you can. It is, definitely. Um, definitely. Now, something that we get so many questions through our social media about and a lot of people ask about is confidence and how, how can I improve my confidence? I personally believe that the best players don't fluctuate in confidence too much because they have a deep belief in themselves. They truly believe that they're going to succeed on that day and mm-hmm. if they don't, they believe they'll do it the next day. What is something you try and help your athletes with around confidence? I think I think the first thing is that, that there are some. I, I mean, I, I I agree with that. There's a, there's an inner there's an inner conviction. I think there are some myths around confidence. Um, I think one of those is that you know, in order for me to be confident, I have to feel confident first. Um, and I, I think that's kind of a myth because confidence is something you get from actually. Um, it, it, it's something you get payback from doing things. So, so rather than kind of rephrase it from rather than confidence being a feeling, actually confidence being an action. So for me to get com- feel confident, I have to do something first. So, so for instance, for me to be able to hit down the ground and be confident, actually I can, you know, against the spinners, hit hit the ball over the top and actually clear them. I actually have to know that I can do that in training first, and I need to know I can do it under pressure. Then I need to know I can do it on different surfaces. I need to know, I need to know I can do it with an old ball, a new ball. I need to know that. Mm. And, and and then you go, actually, I've got robust confidence because mm. it's actually coming from evidence from the training environment. Mm. Um, so I think that, that, that for me is true. Like I think fake, com- there's the fake confidence can be, I've got the belief, but then well, I'm not going to do anything to kind of develop reinforce it, it, reinforce it. Whereas like true inner belief is kind of, how do I know I can bowl a Yorker at the death um, and have confidence in my skills to go wide Yorker, um, straight Yorker, slow ball, like Yorker. It comes from the training From ground. doing it. From doing it, yeah, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. Awesome. So something that a lot of young people struggle with is um, perfectionism, which you, you touched on before, and, and dealing with mistakes. And I think a lot of um, young players... They, they might hit one or two, shank them, not hit them out of the middle, and they start to beat themselves up or bully yeah. themselves. And and that then just flows on and affects the rest of their net or even their match. How do you help players deal with mistakes and how do you help that sort of not feeling like you're playing well if you're not playing at your absolute best? I think I think a lot of it's the key, the skill of acceptance. Like you have to accept that it's not going to be perfect. You have to accept you're going to make mistakes. You have to accept you're going to get it wrong. You have to accept that it's not going to feel great every time you go out and go out and play. Um, and one of our um, one of our uh, batting coaches w- once said, I mean, he's been a very successful player you'll have played with probably, um, Mark Ramprakash. He said, probably you know, like of all the times I've played, there's probably one in a hundred where I'd I'd feel I'd feel like great. And mm. um, like a lot of the time, you 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 fight it, you fight it. Yeah, yeah. Um, that's something that I think, like I, I did a talk last night and I showed a video of Steve Smith after the Ashes where he had all the success and averaged over 100 and he said, oh, I probably wasn't hitting the ball at my best. And Graham Swan said, you're joking. And then he said, no, no, I was just in a good mental space and I was making good decisions. And I think something that I've learned over the last few years is the best players are probably not happy, but they're willing yeah. to perform at or be at 70% or 80% or 92% of their best yeah whereas I think often as kids or amateurs we get caught up trying when we're not at 100% we feel like we're not playing well yeah yeah we judge ourselves again we judge ourselves against that I think if you can get into that that mindset of acceptance it's not perfect 
you, you, you'll go a long way. Um, I talk about, when we talk about this character, we call like the, you know, you're in a voice, you're in a critic, the judge, so to speak. And the judge will always be there. Mm. You'll always hear it saying, oh, that wasn't good enough or should have been better or, you know, you, you ought to do ought to do better next time. That's always going to be there. Yeah. Just accept it. Right? And it's, I, th I think from what I've learned is, and correct me if I'm wrong, but I think it's also, once you've accepted it's there, it's just trying to not give it attention, trying to yeah. not give it energy and trying to give attention and energy to things that serve you. And that serve you, yeah. So watch it, watching the ball, cheering into your intent and, and, yeah. and those things. But one, like, well, as you just said, one of the best skills any bad or sports person can have is that you, we're not perfect and we yeah. are going to make lots of mistakes and learn to embrace the mistakes. Absolutely. And I always say like, there's, a, there's a time to switch, switch on your perfectionism. Um, like the perfectionism is great in a train environment where you know you go in the hard yards and actually you're trying to master your skill and you're trying to master like the diff the different parts of the game. The time for perfect the, the time not for perfectionism is in the game scenario when you um you know you you're in a tricky situation you don't want to be thinking perfection thoughts at yeah, that point yeah. in time. Remember again one of our batters it was one of the best bits of like applied coaching at sin um, one of our. England batters um, kept kept nicking the ball. This is this is going back a few years ago when I was on the men the men's side. Um, this player's getting really fraught up, really frustrated with themselves. And the batting uh, coach at this particular point in time just says, "Mate, it's one more run. It's one more run. Doesn't matter like whether it looks great. Doesn't matter whether your bats come down perfect. It's one more run. Yeah. The game's about scoring runs." Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And we we often get too caught up in doing things perfectly, but. That's what it's about. Um, now, just before we get towards the end and we wrap up, um, you've got a busy day ahead, so I really appreciate your time being here today. Um, you've been involved with the England women for the past two years. Um, something that I've started to pay a lot more attention is, is women's cricket, and I've been really impressed by the, the improvement, and I think the skill is going through the roof. I was in India a couple of months ago, and the, I was just incredibly impressed by the young girls coming through. I think the 12-year-old yeah. girls were almost better yeah. skill-wise than the boys. What have you seen in the progression of women's cricket over the last few years? I think it's just um, there's, a, there's a professionalism, isn't there? There's um, the, 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 atti the, the, the attitude to improve, improve the game. The, the, they're very, very much outward looking now rather than um, looking at you know, in innovation. You know, like, so look at some of the work that, that again we've done this 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 year like all the stuff around power hitting and always looking at new ways to kind of innovate and go where the game's going really um but the girls are fitter now they're stronger now they've got more skills now than ever ever before and i think and again the more the more people watch the game the more money there is in the game the more you can pay players the more that they can train it, it, it everything feeds itself doesn't it they've got yeah. opportunities to go to the big bash um, in Australia, you know, obviously got the KSL just coming up now. But again, we, again, players from um, other countries, the best players in the world, be coming into that competition. It's just brilliant to see. Yeah, absolutely. I couldn't agree more. I think women's cricket in ten years will be almost on on par with men's cricket. I'm yeah. sure. Um, now, final few questions that I ask all our guests: what's What's the best piece of advice that you've ever received? Keep it simple. Yeah, great answer for uh, for cricket. Keep it simple. Yeah, keep it simple. What's your definition of success? Um, oh, put your ego on the line. I think. I think if you can, if you can put your ego on the line, whilst feeling fear. I think that's the that's the, the I think that's the true the bet the, the the most successful and then again this is from my work with in, in Olympic sports as well. The best athletes are that I I see the the, the the truly truly great athletes are those that put their ego on the line. Right, interesting. That's a no, not an answer we've had before. I like that. That's cool. Yeah. And finally, why do you play cricket? Oh, that, for me, my motivation is completely different now. I mean, that, mine's more about now about um, trying to help my local community, and um, yeah, my motivations are completely different now. Yeah. Really. Yeah. Awesome, mate. Mike, thank you so much for your time. Yeah, no worries. And for your great insight, I'm sure our viewers have got a huge amount of value out of that. So thank you. No worries. Cheers.